Okay, well, great. Um, okay, well, I am uh, going to call to order the committee the whole meeting. Um, it's uh, Monday, March 1st. Uh, we have two items tonight. Um, we're going to start with an introduction of our new air director. Um, and I think Martin was going to uh, help us with that introduction, but I didn't see him online yet. Martin, are you with us? He's here. I just let him in. Oh, okay. Good evening, Council President Corbin. Good evening, Council. Uh, Apologize for that. I had to get through the gates. To get in. Okay, no, I understand. So it's my pleasure to introduce our new airport director, David Dakota. David is a, a native Washingtonian, a graduate of uh, Thomas Jefferson High School in Federal Way. He's an undergraduate degree from North Dakota and a graduate degree from Western Governors University. He started at Boeing Field in 2006 and worked his way up to the uh, airport duty manager by the time he left there in 2013. He uh, left there and went to the Hayward Executive Airport down in Hayward, California as the airport operations manager. He was there for four years and from 2013 to 2017. And then after that, he left the uh, Hayward Field and went to City of Livermore as their airport division manager and managed that airport, um, similar size, actually a little larger airport than ours, similar number of operations. Um, managed that airport from 2017 to, to just February 2021. Um, when he came to us. David's been with us about two weeks now, um, and uh, we've been happy to have him. He's an uh, accredited airport executive by the American Association of Airport Executives. He's also a certified commercial pilot and a certified flight instructor. So we're really happy to have David here between the wealth of experience and knowledge he has at other airports and airports with similar, um, uh, similar operational characteristics as ours. Um, he's a uh, Characteristic uh, interesting enough coming from an airport, uh, Livermore, that also has gone through a change in aircraft designation going from a B2 to a uh, B3. And uh, they've been working on that. So he's familiar with that, with that sort of uh, uh, characteristics from uh, dealing with the FAA. Um, David, I, again, I'll let you say, say, I don't know if you have a few words you'd like to uh, say to the council. Right. Yeah, thank you for the introduction, Martin. Um, Council President Council. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, uh, you know, tell you how excited I am to, to be here uh, working for the city um, and, uh, and really excited to be back here in the Northwest. So, um, again, just, you know, really happy to be here and, and um, excited uh, for the airport. Good. Um, well, well, welcome, David. It's very nice to see you again. I actually uh, met you briefly at the um, the uh, rent, uh, rent and airport advisory committee and enjoyed it and i know you were received well there um can i ask a council does anybody have any questions for david at this time uh mr president uh yes uh council member halloran hi um i would just like to ask um what do you see as the most exciting opportunity for our airport in the next three five seven years yeah you know i would say you know just the the general uh growth of the airport you know we have quite a few uh, parcels here on the airport that are meeting the end of their useful life so um you know there's going to be some decisions on that need to be made on you know uh, what we do with those parcels but i i think uh, that's pretty exciting that you know right here in the metropolitan area so close to um, Seattle, and just given our, our location, you know, um, the proximity to a lot of business, you know, just to see that growth and, and um, of the airport in general. Okay. Uh, any other questions from council members? All right. All right. Well, it's it's a pleasure to, to welcome you aboard, and thank you for coming and joining us here in the city. It must be nice to, to come home back to the Northwest. Um, as, as a bit of trivia, um, David's assignment was actually, uh, his last previous assignment was in my hometown. He, he and I had never met, but um, but actually the first flight I've ever taken in a small airplane was out of the Livermore Airport. <laughs> so that was kind of, kind of fun to make that connection. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. 
Um, okay, and with that, we'll move to the second item then um, on our agenda. Um, we get a community court update, and, um, and Judge Murphy, are you going to lead us through that? I am. I am. First of all, I just want to say thank you very, very much for the invitation to come back and to talk. I see there are a lot of new faces on the council uh, from when I was appointed in 2019. And Councilwoman Perez and Councilman Prince, I think, might have been at the recent Rotary meeting. So some of this is going to sound very familiar to them, but better to hear it many times than to not hear it at all. Um, and I also want to point out that uh, Bonnie Woodrow, who's our court services director, is also on here. She's always my wing woman in case I you have any questions about numbers or money or those kinds of things that I might not be able to answer. She's been with us, I believe, for about 11 years. And so I was appointed um, in November of 2019, and I was appointed in response to the city's decision to launch a community court. And so I want to share just a little bit about what the court does first. And then I just want to chat about community court, kind of making it conversational and making sure that I'm answering any questions or concerns that the rest of you have. So, um, Ms. Julia, are you, uh, I should I should attempt your last name, Ms. Julia, and I didn't, I'm sorry. She's, she's the keeper of the slides for me. So the third, we can just get right to the third, uh, right to the um, third slide. I just wanted to share, I know we have at least one attorney in the group. I remember from last time I was here. Uh, and I just want to share uh, very briefly uh, what types of cases uh, we handle in Renton Municipal Court. So slide number three, we're just going to skip the first two. I've already introduced Ms. Woodrow. Sorry. That's okay. Don't be sorry. This is <laughs> your fault. Better, better you than me. So, right? Yep, yeah, that's right. Yep. Okay, two, three. There we go. All right, so again, for the attorneys in the group, you probably already know this, but in Renton Municipal Court, here are the types of cases that we handle. Uh, first and foremost, we handle criminal cases. And so uh, most people know this, but felonies are all uh, crimes punishable by a year or more in jail. Misdemeanors are all crimes punishable by 364 days in jail or less. And then in the, in the uh, family of misdemeanors, there's two types. One are simple misdemeanors and others are gross misdemeanors. Simple misdemeanors simply means that the maximum jail time is typically 90 days in jail. Uh, the other thing that we handle, although we don't do a lot of them, I think it's important that everyone know that we can do them, are orders for protection. So if somebody is looking for an anti-harassment order, for a protection order, for a stalking order, for any type of order prohibiting contact where, they, where they're fearing the contact of another individual, they can come to Renton and petition for one of those types of orders. When I say that we don't do a lot of them, it's not because we're not available to do them. It's because many of them, after the temporary hearing is held and after the temporary order is issued, many of them have to be transferred by law to superior court uh, because they involve children, they involve houses, they involve cars and pets and all kinds of things. And so. Typically, people are sent to the uh, MRJC in Kent for protection orders because it, it's just a more seamless delivery of services if you get your temporary order in the same location that you're going to be seeking your full order. It's difficult when someone's dealing with a stressful situation or a traumatic situation to have them running from courthouse to courthouse. And so in general, most uh, victim advocates and most service agencies instruct people to go to the local uh, county hub, which would either be MRJC in Kent or the Seattle uh, co courthouse downtown. The other thing we handle are traffic and photo tickets. And then finally, the other, the last thing we handle are impound uh, cases. If you believe that your car was improperly impound or you believe that you were improperly charged for tow fees or impound fees, you have a chance to be heard on that issue as well. So that's what we handle. I'm going to move to the next slide and just show you some kind of numbers, which will make it clear why we are moving in the direction of a community court. So, and then next slide. So in 2020, here was the breakdown of our uh, criminal cases. We had 167 DUIs filed. We had 401 criminal traffic, which means any criminal case other than a DUI. We had 1,778 criminal non-traffic um, cases filed, things like domestic violence, criminal trespass, theft, harassment. Uh, and then 
I put this little note here, but every one of those cases, every one of those 2,000 and some cases that got filed last year, um, either end up in dismissal, very few of them, um, a resolution or a guilty plea or a diversion contract of some type or a trial. And um, so that, that's kind of how the court runs. Those are the kinds of cases that we see. But I want you to really take a look at the 1,778 number. 1,778, again, includes domestic violence, criminal trespass, theft, harassment, and other types of non-traffic cases. When you remove the domestic violence cases from those numbers, we are probably, I would say, still around the 1,300 range. And Julie, you can go ahead and move to the, to the next slide. And actually, I may have you take me off the slides for a minute because I want to be able to really engage in this in the next part of this. Um, but for the 1,300 cases that involve primarily trespassing and theft three, um, again, for the non-attorneys in the group, a theft three is the lowest type of theft that there is. If you are charged with a theft one or a theft two, it means that you've, you've stolen some, allegedly stolen something, excuse me, in, in a much higher value. Theft three is typically our shoplifting cases. Sadly, because the um, King County Prosecutor's Office is declining a lot of cases because of budget constraints, sadly, we're getting some larger thefts in municipal court. Uh, we're getting thefts that range anywhere from a simple shoplifting case up to about $1,500 in value, which is a lot for a misdemeanor. Uh, the other thing that we see a lot of are criminal trespass. When you are on property, you don't have permission to be on. When you've been told by Walmart because you've, you've created havoc there before, or you've been a nuisance there before that you can't come back on the property. Those are so many of the types of cases that we see. And what we, what we know in the criminal justice system is this. Most people come to that type of criminal behavior because of one of a very small family of types of issues. One is homelessness, poverty, mental health issues, addiction issues. So when you look at the underlying causes of those types of crime, and then you look to whether or not the types of resolutions that you have available really address those underlying issues, the answer is typically no, it doesn't. The, the, the mainstream court system for many, many years has responded to criminal cases in terms of a graduated sanction or a graduated penalty. Because my number one concern on the bench is keeping the community safe which means not seeing people again, right? So if I'm looking at a way to keep, to keep our local retailers feeling like they don't have to worry about Sticky Fingers McGee coming into their store every day and taking their stuff, then there has to be some deterrent for that person going into the store and taking their stuff. And so for many, many years, the way it's worked is you steal something and maybe the first time you get on probation and don't do it again, you're on probation, you have to do some community service. The next time you do it, maybe you have to do a day in jail and you're on probation. And the next time you have to do five days in jail. And so the, the sanctions continue to get graduated. But the reality is if you don't address the underlying issues, those sanctions bear no relationship at all with why the person is before the court. Someone who is addicted to methamphetamines or heroin or, or any other type of street drug, they're, they're not really cognizant enough to understand what two days in jail really means. Half the time they're detoxing for the whole few days that they're there. And so what we found in mainstream court is, especially in this level of court, we end up with what's a revolving door. And it's very frustrating. Um, I, I'm on social media to a very limited extent because I have to be careful of the ethical constraints of being on social media. But I know since moving to Renton, I know that when people talk about package thefts and car prowls and people standing in front of 7-Eleven exposing themselves or those types of things. I know that people get very frustrated that they perceive there's not a response. And that's not true. There is a response, but the response, we have to keep in mind the resources that we have available. We have to keep in mind the amount of money it costs us to keep people in jail. And I'm sure the council is well aware of the cost of having individuals from Renton in the SCORE facility. So years ago, many years ago, therapeutic courts began to emerge. And therapeutic courts in general mean this. If we identify what brings you into the system and you agree to address those issues, then the theory is if you address the things that led you to criminal behavior, then you will get back on a track that will significantly reduce the chances that we'll see you again. And so some of the therapeutic courts started with things like drug court, veterans court, 
DUI courts. Um, we have all kinds of therapeutic courts. At this level of court, um, one of the largest types of therapeutic courts is community court. So the way that community court is, will work, and I, I want to I digress just for a moment. There's, a lot of, there's been a lot of talk about whether we have a community court or don't have a community court. We began community court planning in December of 2019. We organized a steering committee of different shareholders in the city. I can share with you that on that steering committee, on that planning committee, um, has been a uh, 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 deputy chief of the uh, Kevin Keys. Um, it was our city manager, now to be our new city manager. It's our chief prosecuting attorney. It's one of our public defenders. It's our probation officer. It is um, uh, the Maggie Breen, the director of development from Reach. It is um, Melissa. Um, I always forget Melissa's last name. She works for the library system. She works at all the rent and library locations, de de delivering social services. Guy Williams from the city. We've got Melissa we Glenn. To... Uh, Melissa Glenn. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilman Halloran. So Melissa Glenn. Um, and then, uh, and then recently, we uh, were asked by RAP if, if they could have a, a person from their or from their uh, organization involved on the committee as well. So we were meeting on a very regular basis. We were coming up with forms. We were locking in service providers. We really had every, everything in place ready to hit the launch for September 1st, 2020, and COVID hit. And everything got put on hold. And I, I'm glad that it happened when it did, I guess, because as I share with you how community court works, you will understand how imperative it is that it happened in person. So the way that community court works is this. Someone comes into the system through the filing of charges by the prosecuting attorney. They meet with their public defender and it becomes quickly apparent to the public defender that what they're really dealing with is a client who's homeless, a client who's dealing with a meth addiction, a client who has schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or multiple personality disorders, not taking medications as prescribed. They say to that person, we have a program available in Renton now where if you agree to, to walk into certain services, you agree to connect on a regular basis, you agree to do all the things that you say you need in order to get you back on track, you will ultimately enjoy the dismissal of all of your charges. Now, the person has to say yes. And I would love to tell you that everybody says yes. But for many people who we see in this revolving door, they'd rather just sit the five or 10 days in jail because engaging in services is difficult work. Now, my hope is that I'll be able to encourage them that some of the barriers to services they've, they've experienced in the past will not be barriers in community court because here's how it works. You said defense attorney says to the prosecutor, my client, Mr. Johnson, would really like an opportunity to be considered for community court. The prosecuting attorney's office has a list of criteria. You cannot opt into community court for a DUI. You cannot opt in for a domestic violence charge. This is all for now, by the way. So I don't want to say that they'll never be able to. You cannot opt in for a crime of violence. Right now, they're limited to trespassing and property crimes. So the prosecuting attorney takes a look at their record and says, yeah, Mr. Johnson's a great candidate for community court. So then community court is going to be every Thursday. It's going to be in council chambers. Hopefully that space is still going to be available to us. And what's going to happen is Mr. Johnson, his first week he shows up, he's going to sit down with a screener. And that screener is going to be somebody who sits down in a private room and, and gives Mr. Johnson an assessment of the types of things that he needs in his life, the types of things that he has not been able to access in his life, and then is going to put together a proposed plan, service plan for Mr. Johnson. Then Mr. Johnson is going to come into the, the city council chambers. He's going to be handed a lunch. He's going to be greeted by a volunteer who's going to have him take a seat and kind of observe what happens the first day. But in the, in the city council chambers, either in person, hopefully that was the plan, or via Zoom, or a combination of both, depending on social distancing criteria, uh, about six months from now, those social service providers that we would order people to go get to when they have no transportation and no child care and no, no any way, no resources, they're all going to be in that room. So in that room will be a table with the housing provider. In that room will be a table with the DSHS representative who can help people get set up for state assistance. In that room will be someone from the Alcohol and Drug Assessment Agency who can, who can do an assessment on the spot. So we've taken out all the traditional barriers to accessing services. And then 
when you get your assessment and you observe the first time, then you have the chance to say, yes, I'd like to be part of this, or no, I don't want anything to do with this. And if you say, yes, I'd like to be part of this, you sign a contract. And that contract, because we like to use fancy legal language as councilwoman, is it Vaughn? Knows. We like to use legal, fancy legal language for everything. Is called a stipulated order of continuance. And basically what that, what that litigant says is, I give up my right to a trial in this case. I'm not pleading guilty. I'm not acknowledging I'm guilty, but I understand that if I opt into this program, I'm not gonna have a chance to take my case to a trial. The reason for that is it's not fair to have the prosecutor take a case to trial two years after it happened. But you, you sign this contract, you then come into the program and you come every Thursday to court. Right now, mainstream litigants come to court every four to six weeks. If you are on drugs or you are suffering from mental health issues or you are homeless or you are or dealing with other types of barriers, four to six weeks is an eternity, you guys. It is an eternity. And so asking someone to come back every Thursday and asking them to bite off small pieces of their plan is a much more achievable program than ordering them to do 10 things before you see them next time. So what will happen is the first Thursday they come, I may say, you know what, uh, Ms. O'Halloran, it's really nice to see you today. It looks like you've got three goals for this program. One is to get an alcohol and drug assessment to get into treatment. One is to get on, the, on a waiting list for housing. And one is to get gainfully employed. So let's do this. Let's start this week with just getting your assessment done. Let's just, that's the only goal we have for this week. Let's get your assessment done. And good news is they're right across the hallway. So I'm going to have you walk out right now, go across the hallway, get your assessment, come back and see us when you're done. So each week you're giving these individuals very small, very measurable goals. Next Thursday, they come back and you say, all right, all right, Mr. Prince, I asked you to get two job applications in this week and bring me proof that you did it. Where did you apply this week? And you know what? Mr. Prince may tell me he applied at one place and he just didn't have it in him to make it to the second place. In mainstream court, you might get sanctioned for that. In community court, you will get recognized for the effort you put to move forward. You get recognized for saying, putting in one job application is probably more than Mr. Prince may have done in the last 10 years of his life. And so we're gonna recognize the progress that you made. So next week you need to put in this many more and you need to do this many hours of community service. And so the idea is that on a system of, kind of like with children, I suppose, if you try, you, you, you take your children where you are and you recognize small accomplishments, the whole time, making sure they understand the consequences of not following through. So as long as someone's coming back each week, so, so each week when they come, this week it might be that they're meeting with housing and, and um, substance abuse folks. Next week, it may be that we're dealing with someone who's a vet and we have veteran services there from Valley City. So veteran services will meet with that individual and say, you know what, you may not even have known this, but because you served our country, here are all these amazing resources available to you. And I wanna connect you with those resources. So each week when you come, you have a chance to connect with all the services that you need without being overwhelmed. Um, and again, the idea is these contracts last for about 12 months. Um, we, we, do, we do try to, to reward people. The first reward may be just an applause. The second award may be a $5 gift card to Starbucks. So we really try to give small and affordable rewards to people to, to praise them and to recognize them. The other thing that, that you do in a therapeutic court is you call the people who, who are doing well, you call them first because the biggest reward you can give someone is getting out of court first. No one likes to be stuck in court for three hours. So you let those folks out of court. Um, after you meet with your service providers, with the staffing team staffs your case, and then you come meet with the judge. Very different than a traditional courtroom. In community court, you are Judge Kara. You don't have a robe on. You sit down at the table, so you're eye level to eye level with the person that you're working with. You try to establish a relationship that makes them feel comfortable sharing with you with what, what their struggles are and where they are, uh, which I think makes it a much more authentic process. And then as long as you're moving forward, you get called first, you get sent on your way. If you are not moving forward, if you have not done what you say you're going to do, then the penalties, again, very different than mainstream court, they're gauged for a therapeutic court. The penalty the first time may be the fact that you get held till the end of the calendar. The 
penalty the second time may be that you have to do two hours of community service before the next community court. So the penalties seem like much smaller baby steps than you might see on CSI or Law and Order or even downstairs on the third floor, but they're really meant to be proportionate to what you've assigned the person to do. So that is an overview at, at the end of 12 months if you've done everything you're supposed to do then the city is obligated the city prosecutor is obligated to do what they've agreed to do which is to dismiss all the charges against you so that is in general how it works i can tell you the numbers of people originally when we were going to be in the building um, our talk was to limit the community court initial community court program to about 20 litigants that's really 15 to 20 was really about as many as we thought we could meaningful ha meaningfully handle in the very beginning um, we may have to rethink those numbers because of social distancing and other post pandemic restrictions that we may be dealing with again the plan was to have all service providers in in on on site we will still have them on site but miss woodrow and i are talking about the fact that we may have to have kiosks set up for a few of the providers. So it may be that um, the housing people, instead of being physically present each Thursday, they may alternate with the veterans services folks and one week one's on Zoom on the kiosk and one week. So we're gonna have to work out all those all those um, things once we, once we know when we're opening. I, I hope that you can kind of see why we can't do this virtually. If any of the council folks from other jurisdictions brag to you that they're doing their community courts virtually, ask them the following question. Did you already have a community court in place when COVID came along? The answer is yes. Courts that were already doing community court, courts that were already doing DUI courts, those folks did not want to lose those people in the midst of a most stressful, traumatic situation, which has been hard for all of us to deal with, let alone some of our community court participants. So are there courts doing community court Virtually, the answer is yes. I'm on the state therapeutics court um, committee. I meet with them uh, once a month. I can tell you that they're, they're not getting a very good turnout. It's not the same, but it is really meant for people who are clinging on with by the skin of their teeth to keep from going back to using, to keep from going back to the streets. And so having something available is really, really important. And then the last thing I want to mention, because a couple of people on the council and in Rotary and other programs have asked me about this, the elephant in the room. Um, when, when I was first tasked with the uh, job of coming up with a community court plan, and that was, and for the council members who are a little bit newer, uh, in Renton prior to December of 2019, we had about a judge and a half's worth of work, so not enough for two judges. So I was here about half, a third to half time for the last 10 years. I've been here for a super long time. So if you saw me in the building, that, that's why I was here. So I was a dedicated pro tem to Renton for just about 10 years. I, I often asked why we didn't have a community court. Ms. Woodrow often asked why we don't have a community court. And then eventually um, the city manager and the mayor, Mayor Law were like, why don't we have a community court? I'm like, I, will, I want us to. And so the, the second judicial position was created with the expectation that half the position is dedicated to community court and half the position is dedicated to mainstream. So my job was to get community court up and running. And um, I wanna thank Benita Horn. She's not on this meeting, I understand that, but uh, right before COVID hit, the next step in the process was, was for us to do community forums at the local library, at local churches, at local coffee shops. We were going to make available over the summer last year um, an opportunity for local residents to come and say, is this, is this a Band-Aid? Are these free passes? What is, because people get a really kind of, not an accurate um, perception of what therapeutic courts do. We couldn't have those meetings. And um, when, I, when I spoke with RAP a few months ago, um, now uh, City Executive Van Vailey, then Chief Van Vailey, invited me to come and speak to the RAP group. And, Ms. Horn said, she said, what's your next step in the process? I said, once we're allowed to be together again, we need to begin these community forums because we can't hit the go button if the community thinks this is this is not a legitimate way of doing business. And so uh, Ms. Horn and Dr. Smith and some others challenged me and challenged the prosecutor and said, our residents have gotten really, really savvy on Zoom. There's no reason you can't start your community forums right now. And I thought, okay, true that, that's true, okay. So tomorrow night is our first one. I believe we have 30 some people registered. It's, it's open for up to 50. 
Um, they're just members of the community. It's been very well advertised. Thank you very much, City. Um, and so we're gonna we're gonna have a number of those so people have a chance to understand. Um, if, you, if you're on any of the rent and social media pages, you know that it only takes five really local people on one of the Facebook pages to educate the entire community. We want that to be a positive thing. Um, and so my hope is that as word continues to get out, but the but the elephant in the room I meant to mention earlier is once, once they created a second position, you do not want to be in a position to turn around and say, okay, we want some more money now. You don't want to be in a position to do that. And I will tell you that many of the community courts started with no money. It was our commitment to begin the community court with no money. Um, that was um, a part of every one of our task force meetings were how do we expect to accomplish this? So it was going to come down to the generosity of local businesses to, to donate some of our lunches that we hand out to our participants. It was going to come down to uh, people who really embrace therapeutic courts donating $5 Starbucks gift cards. But we were, as a team, we were prepared to to solicit those types of that type of support from our local community because we expected to have to show the city council we expected to have to show the city for the for the pioneer members of community court this has been a really successful thing and it's worth investing in our courts this way so when when rotary members have asked you know why haven't you asked us for money or why haven't you asked it's not that we don't want to ask for money it's not that we don't need money because we we do need money i will tell you right now that my biggest fear and my most the biggest fear from the very beginning about community court has been someone has to monitor these cases. Someone has to serve as a navigator for these people. And we have one probation officer in the seventh largest city or eighth largest city in the state. Our probation officer is very, 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 her bandwidth is stretched to maximum capacity. And so one of the discussions that's been happening is how are we going to pull in more people able to help monitor these cases? And initially, we plan to do that together as a team, but as this program grows, we are going to need another probation officer. And so it's gonna to have to be just a matter of, of seeing how the program goes initially, hoping that you, we blow your socks off in terms of the kind of feedback that you're hearing, and then hoping that between money that's allotted for homelessness, for addiction issues, for mental health issues, there are very few programs that folks that encompass all of those issues and community court is one of them. So if you're looking to put any money towards programs that deal with homelessness, mental health issues, addiction, poverty, all of those things, um, this program encompasses all of those things. So that is why you, you've not seen any, any uh, requests for money because we, we have been, we were, and we have been committed to beginning, uh, beginning the program on the generosity of the community and others um, in the social justice system and in the legal system who feel so strongly that I, I think I think we can get what we need to help our first few folks. Um, all the service providers appear at no at no cost because all of them accept state insurance. So anybody who has state insurance uh, will be eligible for the programs. And if they don't have state insurance, they'll start with the DSHS table and they'll get state insurance. So if they don't have a driver's license or a, or a photo ID to get state assistance. They will go to that table first and they will get a photo ID and we will have the funds to pay for it to make sure they have the $14 to get one. And if they can't get one because they don't have their birth certificate, we will get them the $40. I'm just saying, you see how it, it is a it is a very, very cumbersome system for people. So we are going to help remove anything that has been a traditional barrier to services. So that's kind of community court in a very 20 minute nutshell. Um, and I, I want to I want to leave time for you guys to ask questions. I, I hope I covered everything you expected me to cover, um, but that that's what things look okay. like. I, I brought I'm not going to show my other slide. I brought it to the council uh, meeting when we talked about the budget. But we are also being incredibly mindful. Um, I don't know some of you know Dr. Robert Livingston, but he is um, at Harvard Kennedy School, and he he talks a lot about. Um, unequal access to services and, and the system and the disparate, disparate treatment of folks of people of color in the system. And, and I can tell you that every step of the way in this discussion has been in order to understand what someone needs, you have to understand where they've been. And I get accused sometimes of being a little social worker for the, for the, from the bench. And I, I, I'm not a social worker from the bench, but I'm not going to be a judge who looks at every theft case the same. I'm not going to be the judge who looks at every obstruction case the same. A young black man who sees an officer approaching his car sees the world very differently 
then I see a situation where a police officer is approaching my car. So when, I, when I'm charged with obstruction, and that young man is charged with obstruction, you have to look at the underlying facts of the case. And a sentence has to be fashioned to meet the underlying facts of the case. And so integral in our discussion about community court has been this assessment tool takes into consideration where you have been, what, you, what your view of the world is, and, and, and how, that, how that affects what your barrier to services has been, what, how that affects your willingness to ask for help. In some cultures, asking for help is taboo. So those are the types of things we have to be mindful of as well. So we okay. talked about that at the city at the budget meeting, but I just wanted to bring that up in case anyone wasn't here, but that's been a really big commitment of the program as well. Okay, so I well, will shush. <laughs> well, Judge Murphy, I know that, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for a great presentation. Very, very interesting. You covered a, a lot of information and um, I, See, it looks like a great program, and I can tell you're really committed. Um, I, we've already got at least one hand raised, so I think there are uh, uh, questions. Um, Council Member Perez? Uh, thank you. I, I raised my hand uh, to ask a question that I already found out is the answer, but I want to take this opportunity to thank you again, uh, Judge Murphy. You have done a great job. Uh, informing the community even with the pandemic as you said it is this is the third time that i see this presentation and i really appreciate it uh i did re i did see the invitation um i, I saw the invitation uh, that benita saw sent to the uh, mayor inclusion task force and the latino forum and that diverse groups um around the area and as well i was just checking the social media and the city uh posted it in the website as well as in social media so so thank you for very much for for your active engagement or passing uh this information and spread this information as much as possible around the community i know that it, this environment is very very hard uh but um but thank you for keep moving uh forward this 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 world because this definitely is the right approach to help our community and especially our most vulnerable and and, and diverse um members of, of, of the city of Renton. Thank you very much, Judge. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Councilwoman Perez, very much. And as Ms. Woodrow and probably Mr. Van Bailey know, I welcome any opportunity to talk. Um, I am so excited about the program. So I've told everyone in the city, if you have a group that you'd like me to speak to, I don't care if it's a group of three people at your at your women's tea every Thursday or your man's men's tea or whatever. I don't care who it is. If you've got a group of people that want to hear more about this, I, I will show up and I will I will talk. I, I love talking about the program. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Van. Thank you, Council President. And um, thank you, a Judge, for your presentation and your initiative uh, to uh, have uh, started the community court. I very much appreciate it. Um, in the past, in 2004, I volunteered as a, a part of the probation department, Seattle Municipal Court. And so we started the Veterans Court, Mental Health Court. So it's very much, you sold me already on this. So I very much appreciate your, your work and efforts in this because it's very much needed in our community. I have two questions for you. The first question is in regarding to in language as, as, as part of this program, that you have when you have um, participants or defendants uh, being uh, a part of it, uh, how do you take that into consideration for those who speak different languages? The, would it be um, in-person interpreter, live? Uh, how, how does that fit into the picture? I would so, imagine. Uh, yeah, we cur so in right now, if for any, in number one, people are, are absolutely entitled to an interpreter for everything from traffic tickets to gross misdemeanor cases. So interpreters are available um, anytime we have in-court proceedings and someone needs an interpreter uh, on zoom uh, we currently have interpreters so what happens what happens now and what will happen in community court if we have any virtual proceedings is the litigant and the interpreter and the attorney are sent into a breakout room to translate and to interpret all of the paperwork there is some some movement um councilwoman van and I, i'm not there's some movement right now to the idea of simultaneous interpretation. Um, not a lot of courts are doing that yet. And so, um, because when you're, when you're virtual and you are, when I'm doing the photo calendar, for example, and I'm giving the instructions, 
it's not possible for those interpreters to be interpreting at the same time because everybody can't hear at the same time. And so um, we've had to devise a little bit different way of doing things. So I type out what I say in court and I send the interpreter to a breakout room to read all of those materials verbatim to the litigant. And then they come back and then it's just myself. So absolutely, interpreters will be available um, in person and virtually. Um, the other thing that I'm sure you know is that all of the social service providers have access to the language line and uh, many of the service providers, whether it's um, uh, Consejo, whether it's uh, a number of our number of our service providers that we use have um, a variety of um, languages spoken on their staff, which I think is really helpful now. But I will never, ever, even on a parking ticket, I will never let anybody proceed if I am not 100% sure that they understand what's happening. And, and understanding uh, conversational English, as you know, is not the same as understanding legal language and legal lingo. And so um, I, I think we've done a really, I would say our interpreter budget, Ms. Woodrow can correct me, don't put her on the spot, and that's probably one of our largest line items because Renton has a very, very, very rich, diverse population of, I, I we have a number of languages on and any particular, I think I had a calendar one day, a traffic calendar. I believe we had 11 interpreters on it, 11 different languages. That, that is, that's amazing. And it, it's, it can be challenging in a, in a great way. Um, but yes, there, there won't be anybody who will plug into any services who won't have a, an interpreter available to them. And I know you had another question, so I don't want to, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you, Judge. Yeah, I just wanted to see the bridging the gap when it comes to the service provider, not necessarily the court process, because yeah. I know that's guaranteed by the court. Um, and relating to your time of the lived experience of the individual, um, do you work with their family cohorts, or how does that go? Is it just the individual itself? How, how extensive do you go about with the lived experiences? If there is a family, um, you know, if, if there is needed for support, or how, how does that fit into this particular community court? Right, right now, the, the place that family members, um, right now, the place that family members are active is typically at the sentencing stage. So, oftentimes, um, oftentimes, when someone's at the sentencing stage, they might invite their family members to appear for sentencing to share a little bit about the litigant, to share a little bit about their story. Um, the other thing that often happens is uh, that the young man on the obstruction charge that I shared, he, he really shared a. a pretty heartbreaking uh, teenage experience with his public defender who just said, Judge, I really think you need to hear this kid's story. And I just invited him to share it. And so, again, I don't think you can you can lead someone in a meaningful direction if you don't know. So at, at in community court, my presumption would be um, that once you do the risk needs assessment, um, that in the beginning, it's probably up to the litigant to pull their family members and support system in. But as we have, as we grow the program, we have more volunteer navigators. Then those navigators will be touching base with those individuals during the week, and we'll be able to pull pull other support services in more easily. So. Great, thank you, um, Council Member Benedetti. Did you have a question or? Um, I did, um, and, and I thought it was answered, but then I just had another one pop up. Uh, so uh, thank you, Council President, uh, and thank you so much, Judge Murphy. This is this is really an incredible, incredible project, and I am so grateful that it's coming. To, I'm so grateful that it's here in Renton. Um, you mentioned the the volunteer navigators. How are you going to recruit those folks? One one of the reasons for one of the reasons for um, the community forums was not only to educate people about how the the community court works, but it's to start collecting, collecting um, the names of those who might be interested in, in supporting the program. And that may be, again, like I said earlier, a local business which says, you know what, I don't have it, I don't have time on my schedule to, to show up and help out, but I would love to donate some McDonald's, I, I shouldn't say McDonald's, uh, well, I love McDonald's, but anyway, so Starbucks, Starbucks gift cards or, the, or a local coffee shop gift cards or whatever. Um, and then, and then to start collecting names. We're not yet in a position to recruit volunteers because the, the liability component of this is so important for the city to look at. Um, and one of the things that's so hard right now, Councilwoman, is just the dominoes in place. If we're in person, there's a different level of liability. If we're virtually, there's a different level of liability. And so I know there are going to be people who want to help. I think of some of the volunteers at the police department who just live for coming in once a week to the police department. Like, I'm hoping those are the kinds of volunteers that we get. But we, we know that 
every 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 Thursday is that's consistent contact. But in between those Thursdays, there needs to be somebody saying, "Hey, Miss Smith, were you able to were you able to get to that appointment after we saw you on Thursday?" We just need people constantly, even if it's a text message, even if it's just a text message. And the attorneys, the, the public defenders, are prepared to do that as well. They're prepared to take a more active role in encouraging their clients in this program. But we, we hoped. I, I'm hoping. We had planned to do six in-person community forums. Uh, I was kind of hoping tomorrow nights would be sold out, but uh, it, it, again, it may be by tomorrow, and and that will help us determine when how how soon to do the next one. But my hope is by the time we do four or five or six of these, we will have a pretty solid list of people who contacted the court and said, "I want to help." I don't know what that looks like, but I want to help, and that will give the team a chance to finalize all the details of the program, to talk to the city attorney's office about liability and what we need to do to put in place to make sure that we've covered ourselves on that end. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, are there any other questions for uh, comments for Judge Murphy at this time? All right. Okay, well. Thank I, you. Yeah, it sounds like, um, I, I mean, you covered a lot of ground and uh, just like the other council members have said, I'm really impressed. Um, really excited about this program. I really appreciate the holistic approach and yeah. eliminating all the barriers, uh, trying to uh, help people be successful. So thank you for that. And thank whoever you said a social worker couldn't grow up to be a judge because my undergrad and grad works in social work. So whoever uh, said a social worker, and I and Councilwoman Perez, if you come tomorrow night, you're going to hear the same thing. So you can take a pass tomorrow night if you want. <laughs> It'll be the fourth <laughs> time you heard it. <laughs> Thank you, Council President right. Corman. I appreciate the opportunity very much. Yeah, well, thank you. And thank you. Uh, all right. Well, with that, okay. um, I'll, okay. I'll go ahead and um, adjourn the committee of the whole meeting and we'll reconvene in 14 minutes for City Council. Thank you very much. Bye bye.